In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly order of Abijai. His wife was a descendant of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Both of them were religious before God, living blamelessly according to all the commandments and regulations of the Lord. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren and both were getting on in on years. Once when he was serving as a priest before God and his section was on duty, he was chosen by a lot according to the custom of the priesthood to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and offer incense. Now at the time of the incense offering, the whole assembly of the people was praying outside. Then there appeared to Zechariah him an angel of the Lord standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was terrified and fear overwhelmed him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, bear you a son, and you will name him John. You will have joy and good gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He must never drink wine or strong drink. Even before his birth, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. He will turn many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. With the spirit and power of Elijah, he will go before him to turn the hearts of people parents to their children and disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah said to the angel, How will I know that this is so? For I am an old man and my wife is getting out in years. The angel replied, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and bring you this good news. But now, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time, you will become mute and able to speak until the day these things occur. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wanted his delay in the sanctuary. When he did come out, he could not speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the sanctuary. He kept motioning them and remained unable to speak. When his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After those days, his wife, Elizabeth, conceived, and for five months she remained in seclusion. She said, this is what the Lord has done for me when he looked favorably on me and took away the disgrace I have endured among my people. This is the word of God. There were men among the 12 tribes of Israel who must have held a mysterious presence in the imaginations of the kids who grew up in those towns. Men who forever smelled like smoke and iron and were always splattered with blood. When these men would pass by on the streets, children would stare as their parents would explain that the man's work was bloody because it was holy. These men were the priests and the blood that they wore was the residue of the animal sacrifices they offered on behalf of the people. God's people grew up in a culture of sacrifice and spoke the language of sacrifice. Without the shedding of blood, there was no forgiveness of sins, they would say. So the priesthood carried from one generation to the next, along with their bloody work, all the way over to the time of an old cleric, cleric named Zachariah. Offered the incense. 
incense. Let him come and draw lots. The number which we have all selected is 43. And remember, whoever is chosen for the honor of giving the incense offering will enjoy the blessing of heaven the rest of his life. Now, all raise a finger. One, two, six, three, seventeen, twenty, sixteen, twenty-seven, forty-one, forty-two, forty-three. Zechariah, you have been selected to perform the incense offering. You also are chosen to serve with me. Zachariah was working in the temple, the angel Gabriel appeared to tell him God was going to give him a son. Zachariah and his wife Elizabeth were old and had been barren their entire marriage, so Zachariah wanted proof. I do not mean to question the Lord, but in my old age and the fact that my family has never given birth before, how is it now that my wife Elizabeth can bear a son? I am the angel Gabriel. Is that not proof enough? Y yes, of course. I, I suppose it is. For your doubting lips, you shall remain mute until the day your child is born. For the entire nine months, you shall not speak a word to your friends and neighbors. You shall not be able to speak with your child in your wife's womb. Until the day she gives birth, you shall remain mute. Though bittersweet, this silence was a gift. Zachariah was given time to think, time to remember the, wor the words and the frame of the guardian of heaven, whose apparition, for some reason, was easier to accept than the words that he spoke. To worship God is to dwell on who he is, to consider his handiwork. How can this occur without stillness? Stillness is a discipline God gives us to cultivate minds that can hold and turn over complicated thoughts without losing them. Silence is a gift God gives to Zechariah, and the old man puts it to use. He had more than enough time to rebuke himself for his doubt and plenty left over to really contemplate what God was doing. He thought of his need for salvation and God's promise of it, he thought of the priesthood and of God's displeasure with his people's rebellion against him. He thought of the angel's words and his own role in God's redemption. And he thought of his son's role. From Elizabeth, Elizabeth's first bout with nausea to the day nine months later when they, along with their astonished kinfolk, laid their tired eyes upon this brand new baby boy, Zachariah held his peace. God used this silence to persuade the old minister that God was sending his salvation to his people and that this miracle baby, his son, was brought into this world to herald the Messiah's coming. New Testament scholar N.T. Wright gives us a good perspective as we consider the first chapter of Luke during Advent this year. He writes, the capital of Ireland is the wonderful old city of Dublin. 
It is famous for many reasons. People go there from all over the world to stroll around its streets, to drink in its pubs, to visit its historic buildings, and to see the places made world famous by writers such as James Joyce. Perhaps surprisingly, the attraction that draws the most visitors in Dublin is the zoo. And perhaps equally surprising, the second most popular site for visitors is the Book of Kells, displayed at the center of a special exhibition at Trinity College. This wonderfully ornamented manuscript of the Gospels dates to around 800 AD, considerably closer in time to the New Testament itself than to us today. The people who arrange the exhibition don't let the public see the Gospels themselves right away. Wisely, they lead you first past several other very old books which prepare you step by step for the great treasure itself. By the time you reach the heart of the exhibition, you have already thought your way back to the world of early Celtic Christianity, to the monks who spent years of their lives painstakingly copying out parts of the Bible and lavishly decorating it. You are now ready to appreciate it properly. Luke appears to have the same philosophy, I think, as the curators of the Book of Kells exhibit. He doesn't even mention Jesus until verse 30 of the Gospel. Instead, he helps us to prepare for the good news of great joy that will be given to Mary by telling us the story of an older couple named Zechariah and Elizabeth, who get some good news of their own. Having thought about the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth today, we will have been transported back to the first century, back to the days when Herod was the king, Having heard Gabriel's message to Zechariah, we will be even more ready to hear what Gabriel has to say to Mary. And having seen how indeed nothing is impossible with God through Zechariah and Elizabeth, we will know Mary's words to be true. Having contemplated the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth today, it will make us ready to appreciate the story of Mary and Joseph of shepherds and angels, and of Jesus being born in a lowly manger. Having heard Luke's story today, we can appreciate what comes next properly. Luke begins by telling us about Zechariah and Elizabeth, who are righteous and blameless. He also tells us that they have no children. It was often thought that barrenness was a punishment from God, but Luke tells us from the start that both Zechariah and Elizabeth are righteous and blameless. So punishment is out of the question. However, if you remember from a couple of weeks ago when we read about Hannah, who also could not conceive the fate for women at that time who did not bear a child, especially a son, was dire, and their shame was great. So Zechariah and Elizabeth must have been feeling the pressure and overwhelming desire to have a son. Now, it was Zechariah's group's turn to serve at the temple, and Zechariah was a priest. Alan Culpepper, who writes in his commentary on Luke, says, the priests were divided up into 24 groups, and each group served twice a year for a week at that time, for a week at a time in the temple. And on this occasion, Zechariah was chosen to enter the sanctuary and offer the incense. A sacrifice was offered twice a day, both on the outer altar and the inner altar inside the sanctuary. A list was compiled of those priests who had never been chosen to enter the sanctuary. And lots were cast to determine who would bring the sacrifice to the altar and clean the ashes off of it. This honor normally came only once in a lifetime. So as Zechariah was serving this once-in-a-lifetime capacity in this way, another once-in-a-lifetime thing happens. A surprise from God, if you will. An angel, a messenger from God, comes to him. And when Zechariah sees the angel, he was terrified and fear overwhelmed him. Zechariah is afraid because he knows this angel is from God. And if you remember, the people of Israel thought that if they saw the face of God, they would surely die. 
In other words, they had an overwhelming respect and reverence for the divine, and now the angel, the angel Gabriel, sent by God, was standing right in front of Zechariah, which was not something that happened every day. And the first thing that Gabriel says is, do not be afraid. Then Gabriel tells Zechariah that his prayers have been heard, and then the really good news comes that he and his wife Elizabeth will have a son. Now Zechariah must have been bewildered by this message. He may have been thinking what a college friend of mine used to say, I may be a fool, but I'm not stupid. And he asked Gabriel, how will I know that this is so? For I'm an old man and my wife is getting on in years. It was a fair question. You know, Abraham back in Genesis, which I'm sure Luke wants us to be thinking about, Abraham in Genesis asked a, simple, a similar question of God when God told him that he and his descendants were to possess the land. But God didn't strike Abraham mute like Gabriel did to Zechariah. However, the direct correlation between Zechariah's question and Abraham's question would give the first century readers a heads up that God is acting in a mighty way, just like in the days of Abraham. Now you can imagine what Zechariah must have looked like coming out of the sanctuary, trying to motion to the people what just went on in there. I think it must have looked something like a bad game of Pictionary, really. But, you know, what, what would Elizabeth have made of it all? He comes home and he can't speak. So when Zechariah's week of service was over, he went home and Elizabeth conceived just as Gabriel said, and she stayed in seclusion for five months. In other words, people did not know that she was pregnant. So to go back to our opening premise, how is this story of Zechariah and Elizabeth supposed to help us prepare for what is to come next? Well, we have been witnesses to how God hears the prayers of those who cry out in distress. We have been witnesses to how God can use ordinary people like Zechariah and Elizabeth to bring about what seemed to be impossible. We have been witnesses of how a message of joy and gladness comes to an old man. And next week we will discover what happens when a similar message is delivered to a young woman. Most of all, what I hope the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth does for us, especially in this next week, is to make us more aware of how God comes to us with news of joy and gladness. I hope that we will be aware that God hears our prayers, and I hope that we will be aware of when in the midst of our daily responsibilities and tasks, God surprises us with a message that will leave us speechless. May it be so.